Thank you for that introduction, Pastor James. Um, it's, it's a great honor to be here, it really is, in this conference. Very, very pleasantly surprised. I think I speak for a lot of us. Really enjoyed the ministry this week, and uh, we're going to have a powerful uh, time tonight with Pastor Greg, so uh, we're looking forward to that as well. Uh, I have a message today that I call the wonder of a local church that I want to look at here in a moment uh, from the scriptures. But I would like to begin with a quote from a man named Israel Zengwell. He was a Zionist, and, and his whole struggle was to try to bring the old traditions, you know, of the Hebrews into the new world with a nation. But he made a tremendous statement about this tension. He said, the past is for inspiration, not imitation, for continuation, not repetition. And this is a very insightful statement about how you want to glean from the past, but you must also go forward. As we commemorate the 50-year jubilee, it's important for us to capture this side of the story. The Door Church in Tucson represents the wonder of what a local church can become. See, our theme this week is Jesus people, and one of the byproducts of the Jesus people revival was the elevation of the local church. In fact, the non-denominational church explosion of the 80s and the 90s is testimony to this. In our fellowship, let me say this clearly, in our fellowship, the local church is the hub of our entire vision. A convert is evangelized, discipled, often married, trained in minister, in ministry, and commissioned under the same roof. I always say this, Pastor Mitchell was ahead of his time. He had the one-stop shop superstore concept way before Walmart. <laughs> so this message today is going to be very simple. The continuation of our inspiration, a fellowship of fruitful church planting congregations requires a renewed appreciation for and the je jealous protection of the local church. And so I'm going to read here in Acts 13 about the first one out of Jerusalem. Verse 1, just three verses here. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up in the Her with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Before I uh, explore this thought, the wonder of the local church, I want to start by talking about drummers, just for a second because I'm going somewhere with this. Tucson Church has been blessed to have some really good drummers. And I'm gonna go ahead and say the next part, just, I can say it safely now because we're in a beautiful venue with great sound. But you know that sanctuary across the courtyard over there? Let me put it this way. Um, many times bad venues happen to good drummers. And uh, we, when I was here, we would have a little bit of a conflict. and, and uh, you know, it's, it's not them, but that, it's not the greatest acoustics over there. And I would even suggest, guys, that you still work on that. And I've been saying that over 10 years. But um, let me just put it this way. Um, I want to be careful about this, delicate about this. But um, an overzealous drummer in that building could affect the same uh, threshold, reverberation threshold, as a 15-car pileup. <laughs> so, you know, we would have conversations about this, and uh, Pastor Bill, Neil, and I, and, and we, and so a decision was made somehow to acquire that plexiglass case right there. And so I'm going to give you a little more insight. Here. I'm going to peel back the veil. Curtis was talking about peeling back the curtain here. 
Pastor Alvin wasn't so happy about it. In fact, uh, um, we had a little brotherly exchange over it. And, um, but I'm going to say, I know what he was doing. He was representing his people. I get it. He works with these musicians. He was just representing. But I want you to see it from my point of view as well. <laughs> Putting a drummer in a plexiglass case is way more humane than shooting him. <laughs> That's where I was coming from. So anyway, what I really want to tell you about this story is I don't want to blame Pastor Alvin, myself, or the drummer. It was the architect, and I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Because we were having a meeting shortly before I left here about, you know, what would become this with the original architect of that building. And while we were sitting there, you know, before he got into some of the plans he was going to show us, I heard him tell Pastor Warner, he said, well, he said, well, Pastor, he said, uh, uh, to tell you the truth, he said, and he's looking around this older building, he goes, we, uh, we decided to build you guys a warehouse instead of a sanctuary because we didn't think you would make it. I was a little, I, beyond these years, I was a little bit offended by that. Because I remember about the time they started working on the plans for that building. I must have been saved about five years. And in my mind, I was already totally convinced we were on our way to total amazingness, you know? And here's this guy making this comment. So what he did not see, and this is what I'm, my first point here, the potential of a local church. He didn't see it. We were intoxicated with the sparkling, fragrant wine of possibility. <laughs> Something he had not partaken of, apparently. And this, this idea of the potential. So I just read about the church at Antioch. This is the first notable work. And what I mean by that, we know there are other things going on, but this church is defined as such. And uh, we see in there this little work beginning to emerge that would become an incredible. We're talking about last night, the Sierra Leone and what, you know, amazing testimony. And there's four workers in 120. And so you see what this little work just was about to explode. So what you see, the principle of the local church is like a tiny seed becoming an entire ecosystem. Matthew 13, I love this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. That is an amazing, an amazing statement of how the kingdom of God works in one seed that God places. That seed can become an ecosystem in its own right. And this is a picture, I believe, of the local church. I was reading about Abraham's oak. I think I have a photograph of it, Abraham's oak. Um, this, is, 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 this is by many considered one of the most amazing trees on earth. It doesn't look all that amazing. But it was in here in Genesis 18 that Abraham and Sarah reserved, re, uh, received the word that she would have a child, that she would have Isaac. And uh, um, we see from there all that emerged from them. You know, something else interesting, because that prophecy was a fulfillment of God telling Abraham that he would have influence all over the world. At the, at the beginning of the second century, after a few, few decades after the fall of Jerusalem, the Jews had another uprising. And this was the uprising to end all uprisings, according to Hadrian, the, the Caesar. And what he did is he went to this very spot in, outside of Hebron, where this tree is, and he used it as a slave market to sell, listen, over 135,000 Jews into slavery. And what was so ironic about that is that in a weird way was the fulfillment of Abraham's prophecy where that was the launching of the great diaspora that put Jews all over the world. And then from there, of course, you see that pilgrims would come and visit this tree. Today, the Jews can't even see it because uh, um, Clinton signed that away a few, a few decades ago. But people would come there and they say, legend has it, that if you peel off a piece of bark, it has healing properties. Now, before you, 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 you scoff at that, it does have the testimonial, testimonial of a 100-year-old man leaving his aging wife in a family way. So it's quite an endorsement there. 
Nevertheless, this tree is a symbol of the, the greatest spiritual ecosystem on earth. That one seed. Because we know not only do all the Christians and the Jews, and you count the Muslims, the influence of Abraham is astonishing. So likewise, the church in Antioch began as just a seed and became a kingdom ecosystem in its own right. It was from there that you begin to read about all the other grand works, you know, that, you, that, 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 that fill out the, the second, the, most of your New Testament. And it was an amazing, and we know it's rooted in Jerusalem, obviously that's important, but when I'm talking about that local church began to emerge in its own right. Ephesians chapter 4 says, he gave uh, them apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of God. So what this tells you, that in that seed, in the local church, is the equipping for God to do something amazing. This church, I'm, you know, we're here at our 50th, and we had amazing gifts in the Tucson church. When I got saved, there were a lot of tremendous elements already in full operation. You know, I st will always remember our big three bands when I got saved, Hosanna, Oil of Joy, and Firstborn. And let me tell you, maybe I'm not a, a much of an expert in music, but I will tell you, I believe they could have competed at that time with the local music scene on any level, on the local music scene. I mean, they were good. One th conversation I had uh, years ago with uh, many of you remember, Alan Kern, and I really meant this. I told him the door preaching, the concert preaching, when I was a new convert, was really good. You can take that as you would, <laughs> but when I got, I mean, it was really good. I remember Alan Kern, the reason I had this conversation with him, I remember he'd cut out, he cut out like an article from the newspaper, you know, they had newspapers in those days, and he would he would read this article, and then he'd make all these wry comments, and then he'd apply a scripture, and it was amazing. It was always good. I remember a, a, a door sermon to this day from Paul Campbell. He was preaching on Noah's flood, the judgment, and he had a refrain in there that I, never left me. It was, sin don't float, friend. Sin don't float. And we had all kinds of these wonderful brethren leaders, people like Brad Breckenridge. He got up to preach one night and he fainted. <laughs> and I'm sure it would have been really good had he maintained consciousness. But that was the standard that we had. We had amazing couples in our church that were fully functional when I got saved. The King, Frank and Susan King, they have been working with children's ministry for almost as long as the church has been around. It's amazing. And a lot of what you see actually has come out of NGM. And a big part of our drama ministry now is, is connected to what was produced there and their little dramas. Eric and Brenda Struts. When I was a new convert, these guys, you could see how they act elevated the game of, the, of the, this church. He, they brought a strength and a professionalism that we really respected highly. And I don't never met anybody that didn't respect them. And there's another couple that many of you don't know well anymore, Stuart and Teresa Reblin. They were on staff here for 18 years. And probably the most explosive growth period was when they were working with Pastor Warner. There was a symbiotic relationship there that was pretty amazing to watch during that time. So what I'm trying to say is a return to the book of Acts type ministry remains, means a return to the power of the local church. I want to quote before I move on here, a man named Thomas Armitage. He was uh, in, highly involved in the Southern Baptist church planting movement at the, end of the, um, 19, at the end of the 1800s. But he had some very strong opinions about what I'm saying. And he said the right of the churches... In the apostolic age, to manage all their internal affairs rose primarily from the fact that each congregation was perfect in itself for all the purposes of its own church life. It was in itself the visible church of Christ and complete for all the ends of a visible church. Churches were local bodies that could be found and known and governed. And these were very important themes 
to us when we first got saved. So I want to talk secondly about the unique identity of a local church. This is what we see emerge here in the book of, Ant excuse me, in the church of Antioch. And I want to introduce a phrase that you don't hear much anymore, but it was very prominent when I first got saved. The phrase was the autonomy of the local church. How many remember that phrase from back in the day? And when we got saved, two important words I learned at Prescott conferences. It was a, we were young. These were on Ruth Street. Uh, and these words were spoken on refrain. The two words, I learned them there. I hadn't heard them in my, my life before that. Indigenous and autonomous. I learned those on Ruth Street and Prescott at conferences. I remember in those days I was trying to um, take notes and uh, these words, you know how, you know how you, I still have these notes. I went back and looked at them once. I spelled these words differently each time I wrote them down. <laughs> I didn't know them. And the one word that was really getting me was the word indigenous. I didn't know what they were talking about. The indigenous church sounded like they're saying engine church with like a little funny, with a little funny emphasis. And, and for most of the week, I thought they were talking about the church in Chinle, actually. <laughs> and engine church. But it wasn't the engine church. It was the indigenous church. But what it means is a church that is original or, 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 or literally uh, it means occurring naturally. Uh, uh, we were there teaching that the, the local body should emerge and become self-supporting, self-sustaining. And the word autonomy actually has a very simple breakdown. Auto, self, uh, nomi is law, self-law or self-rule. And these were ideas I had no idea in my mind at the time how radical Pastor Mitchell was to be talking about the autonomy of the local church within the construct of a Pentecostal denomination where the very building he was speaking at was owned by them. But he was making a point that in order for us to become who God wanted us to be as a fellowship, to emerge, this is a theme that we had to explore, and it all had to do with the capability and the potential of the local church. But that local church then had to have an identity that emerged and an identity that had to be respected in its own right. God clearly speaks to the Antioch church as a self-contained body of believers. It says that as they ministered in verse 2 to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said to them. So in other words, their church planting vision did not come down as a dictate, as a directive, as good as it was. We know that Jesus gave that directive, but we see in real time, the Holy Spirit is talking to them and challenging them. You see in Acts chapter 6 that the, the church uh, is recognized, and this goes back to Jerusalem. Their authority is also recognized. It says uh, they were responsible to appoint and, uh, and, and uh, develop their own leaders there in, in, in the Jerusalem church. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you want to follow this theme Jesus is speaking to seven churches. He addresses them individually as each church. He never addresses them in connection to another church. And I'm not saying, listen, I'll balance that out, but I'm just saying it's very clear to understand that he directs them and he holds them accountable each for themselves. So he's seeing them as their own entities. So what I'm trying to say here as we get to this story, autonomy and the purpose and the unique purposes of God are related to each other. A church emerging and coming into their identity is what actually releases them to pursue these grand ideals that we hold. You cannot simply confer it on somebody in human terms. There's got to be a work of God and an acknowledgement of God's special touch on that congregation. The church in Antioch, uh, um, shall we say, they broadened the, 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 the vision of, the, of their fellowship at the time. How, what, do, what, do you, what do you mean? 
Well, it was through Antioch that we see the Gentile controversy emerge, right? Paul was teaching that you didn't have to circumcise Gentile converts. And there were others, they couldn't wrap their minds around that and uh, without going into that entire controversy. It finally went to Jerusalem, which was the proper place to take it. And in that, though, you see the church of Antioch is discovering something that the Jerusalem church hadn't yet gotten around to. You follow what I'm saying? They themselves had their own identity. And it resulted ultimately in a great breakthrough for everybody. Just throwing this in for free, the first church out was already pushing the envelope. As Antioch's unique identity emerged, it helped everyone, as I said, see the bigger picture. And you want to compare this to parenting, right? We want, right? We want our children to become themselves, don't we? Every healthy parent wants their child to be autonomous. I didn't say you never wanted to see them again. I said <laughs> you want them to be self-governing, independent. You want them to find and discover their unique identity, right? Because they're going to need that to be strong people and to reproduce. This is why you never give your kids too much freedom when they're young. Not just because they'll get in trouble, because they'll never want to leave. <laughs> they'll never, it's too easy. I get to live here, do my thing, man. She does my laundry and makes my dinner, and I get to have my girlfriend upstairs. Man, why go anywhere? No, I mean, your kids should want to leave after a while, don't you think? They should want their independence. They should be saying to themselves, I got to get out of here. <laughs> so the other side to this story is a lot of people don't want to grow up. And there's a lot of churches. They don't, want your, they don't want to discover their identity in God. They like being kind of uh, parish churches, right? <laughs> that works. You know what we call them today? Satellite churches. You know, we talk about satellite churches and, and, you know, basically today a satellite church is where one guy preaches and he has campus pastors and he sends out the big signal so everyone can see him preach in all these different campuses. This is not something that, that we do, but we have our own version of satellite churches. And that is there are guys kind of go out and, and, and they just kind of settle in and, uh, you know, make it a conference and area-wide events and, and, and kind of uh, get by that way. They have no, they've lost the vision to go, to go big. They've lost the vision to be an ecosystem type ministry. It's just kind of like just be a satellite. You know, let me just uh, share some, a good article that provided a plausible defense against the idea. How come we haven't been, we went to the moon 50 years ago. How come we haven't done anything since? Have you ever, you know, and so this is a plausible uh, well, I'm saying that I'm not getting involved in the argument. I'm saying don't come up to me after me and give me Stanley Kubrick's deathbed uh, confession, okay? I'm just sharing an article that seems plausible. And that is one of the reasons why uh, it seems like we've abandoned Captain Kirk's motto to boldly go where no man has gone before is because our concerns about space technology have become much more Earth-centered. And what I'm saying is most of space technology today is in the realm of satellites. Everything today depends on satellites. Our communications, you know, television, uh, uh, defense, weaponry, and so much is dependent on satellites. And they say today, well, since then, there's probably been about 10,000 satellites launched, and today there's about 2,700 satellites in space. So... I'm not defending it. I'm simply saying that that great vision somehow has become very earthbound. And sometimes that's what happens to a church. You lose the identity, for the, I mean, the big picture identity, and it becomes much more pragmatic and rooted to everyday concerns. Here's my point. Fruitfulness is connected to maturity. And maturity is realized in autonomy. 
In other words, if you're going to grow up, let me put this in human terms. If you're going to have babies, you should grow up first and be responsible and independent, right? It's the same idea. So what I'm saying here about this is that this means that our fellowship with each, our relationships with each other have to be based on fellowship in order for you to be who you need to be. Now, let me just balance out what I just said. Autonomy does not mean disconnected and unaccountable to vital relationships any more than adulthood means completely abandoning your parents and the rest of your family and all other forms of interdependence. That's not what it means, right, to grow up. Only to the most fearful mother, maybe, it would mean that. We, I said a moment ago, Barnabas came from Jerusalem, and it was appropriate for him to seek the understanding and the blessing of the Jerusalem church and the apostles in Jerusalem, right, when they had that conflict. They didn't just say, blow them off. I don't care what Jerusalem does. This is what we do. No, he didn't do that. In fact, let me just throw this in. Guys that get sent out and you're on full support and you're out there to do your thing, that's wrong, man. You're taking people's money. You're accountable. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got came from Larry Beauregard. Uh, I, I, I'll just, and that, you know, full confession, I do like to, to innovate a bit. And so Larry was with me for a revival, and he said, Fred, let me give you some advice. Do what Harold does. That's the way we talked in those days. Do what Harold does. And you know what? That was good advice. You know, of course, there's a time and place for everything. But in other words, you got to get set. I, I think the same principle applies. It's like raising kids. Train a child in the way they should go. When you disciple them, disciple them good. And when they're released, they're going to have to become who they are. One of the things that we have, and it's a good thing, Pastor Warner mentioned this in our meeting, we have the, the commitment to tithe. Uh, into the same account that sponsored us, our World Evangelism accounts. Blessed be the tithes that bind, I should say. But um, I understand there are obligations, and those are, there are important obligations, but, it, but there's always going to be this tension, just like with kids. You've got, if you're going to be what you're going to be, you've got to come to terms with some kind of identity. And you need autonomy to find that identity, just like a child would need it. So what happens with a lot of what happens with this theme, a trusting relationship, is you get burned. People do wrong things, and now you're tempted to abandon the standard of fellowship based on that. You know how many people have read God's Forever People? It's a great book about the Jesus Revolution. I hear people refer to this from time to time. Sometimes I wonder if they ever read it because it's not all good. There's some very negative things in there. In fact, I will say a noteworthy percentage of, Jesus, of the Jesus revolution was lost to extremism and bizarre religious practices. There were people out of the Jesus movement that became uh, donned robes, changed their names to Hebrew names, took on several wives, all in the name of that revival. But the greater point is that movement still became one of the greatest spiritual awakenings in American history. So in other words, there'll always be negative things. The poor you will always have with you. You'll always have those elements. There are going to be people that take advantage of fellowship and, and they do the wrong thing, but we have to be very careful not to abandon this wonderful vision that we first had. Let me just say a little something about losing. You know, we had this conversation, if I can speak, go back to my staff person for a moment. We had a conversation when we were here about how this church, the Tucson church, is a victim of, of its own success. And let me tell you what I mean by that in practical terms. Because this church has produced so many conference churches, this church has lost the patronage of those people for conference. Now, here's what I mean. We don't have the, as many delegates from those churches coming to conference. Because 
You know, San Antonio has a conference. Now McAllen has a conference. El Paso has a conference. Las Vegas has a conference. Cape Cod has a conference. Toronto has a conference. Even South London had a lot had more people when we had, didn't have our own conference. And there's Buenos Aires, and there's, you know, I can go on and on. And, and we rejoice. But don't you know that cost the Tucson church? Yeah. Yeah. Tucson church lost because. And then what does the lack of delegates mean? You get less offerings. And less tithes because those churches have become conference churches. So the, this idea that, you know, you'll never lose. Let me tell you, some parenting is turning loose. And that's, have you ever made the connection? That's why Pastor Warner has so many conference churches, maybe. Because you actually end up losing. This conference here in Tucson is, the, is 100% Mother Church Harvesters Conference. This is not an area conference. We are here 100% out of relationship. And it seems to have worked all right. It's been 50 years. We're still hanging around, you know. Let me give you another quote. A guy named H.A. Hodges. He was um, a Church of England guy, but more, less, a, less a theologian, more of a philosopher. But he had a tremendous comment. He said, when a relationship has to be organized or reduced to rule, it has sunk from a fellowship to a mere association. Now, let me just balance out what I'm saying. Organization and those things are very important and they have their place. But you have to have majors and minors. There's no such thing as a perfect balance. Only in kung fu movies are you going to see that. Real life, it doesn't exist. So you're going to have to emphasize one and de-emphasize another. One will be major and one will be minor. You can't have two equal parts of, of organiz, organizational rule and fellowship. And I think that's impossible. You're going to prefer one over the other. And that's what he's saying. That other stuff has its place. We have a wonderful area leader in, in, in the UK, by the way, Nigel Brown. He has a, I tell him all the time, you have an amazing gift to, to administrate and do what he does. I really believe that. I, I tell him that all the time. He takes it as kind of an insult, saying, well, how come you're not talking about my crusades and other stuff like that? But, you know, he's kidding me. But, but he really does. It's very, it, so there are people, the Bible says that's a gift in the church. And thank God for people who do it well and diplomatically. Like Brother Rodney was talking about today. But at the same time, ultimately, we got to be here because we want to be here. We owe no man anything except to love him. So I'm going to close with one thought here, and that's the mandate of the local, the local church. So we see the church, they have their own potential. We see they have their own identity, but we also see in this church they have their own mandate. The Holy Spirit speaks to them, and this is what I want to get to when we talk about sending out churches, people. I'm going to say something, and if you think about it, you'll see it's true. I'm not just trying to be shocking. But saying we plant churches because that is what we do will never work in a local congregation. You'll be a satellite forever. And you can help other people plant churches as a satellite. But it's the same thing as telling your kid, why should I be a Christian? Going to church is what we do. Now, I have told my daughter that several times when she was a kid. You were born into a Christian family. Deal with it. You know? <laughs> I used to tell her that, but she was a little kid. But when you're an adult, that doesn't work, does it? You have to have your own mandate. Every church has to discover its own mandate. The Holy Spirit spoke to this church, and it says that this church, within their own experience and understanding and revelation, laid hands on Barnabas and Saul and sent them out. And so we thank God for conferences. We have a great conference in, in, in South London that we... we, we we have our guys gather around, and let me tell you something. I might, some of the guys from South London are here. They might, I might sound like a total hypocrite to them because I've sat across with these guys at coffee and said, you guys need to plant churches, so I've done it. However, ultimately, I understand there has to be a mandate within that congregation. 
where the congregation has to, not just Pastor Ruby's putting pressure on me to do this, but that local body, right, that has its own ministry and its own potential and has and discovered its identity and God says, the Lord is speaking to us. This is what we need to do with them. You know what the genius of not sending people to Bible school was, in my opinion, the, the, the greater genius of that? It was not depleting the local church of his God-given ministry and those people that he had called to preach because you need those people to find your mandate. The local church has the responsibility to commission and send out workers. That doesn't just mean get somebody to go tonight because it's Friday. What that means is you have the responsibility to cultivate within your own ministry this mandate that the council understands it, that the people in church understand it, that the pastor communicates this, and the people understand it, and they are also hearing the Holy Spirit say, separate unto us. You know, baby churches aren't hatched. They're birthed from local congregations, from households of faith. That means the church has to give birth to it. Not just you in discussions with your pastor and the one guy. And and I understand the logistics and how all that plays out, but I'm talking about a high ideal here, folks, that you want to contend for. I read an article recently about church planting that said... That church planting has, in the last couple of decades, shifted from uh, being the thing of local congregations to Christian venture capitalists. That's what's going on now. And if you want to plant a church, you can go and sit in front of a panel and ask for an investment. And, 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 and listen, I'm not here to, you know, to put someone else down, but that's not what we do. I just said, you know, that's not good enough. Well, I'll say it anyway. That's not what we do. In other words, that is definitely not something, a method that we employ here. Our churches do it here. So what we want, as I close here, is we want our workers to have the spirit of this mandate upon them. And I totally understand, you know, don't say I'm from Apollos, I'm from Peter. But over the years, one of the things you say, you're from Tucson, aren't you? That's right, I'm from Tucson. And people from Prescott, I'm from Prescott. And and we go on like that. But when it's not just pride, sometimes what you're expressing is the mandate of your congregation. That you captured that mandate. And it's it's, it's, it's active in your soul and in your spirit. And it's from that you get an entrepreneurial spirit, folks. To do something for God. You know, we want every worker to be entrepreneurial. Don't we? But be careful, man, that you're not just loading this guy down so much. He can't carry any more letters. You know, I I put together while I was here a fellowship identity list. It's my list. There might be better lists. I think it's pretty good, but it's something I came up with. Ten. You know why? Because I thought it was so important to reduce to a very compact statement what someone needs to know about themselves. That That was reason number one. Reason number two is so we wouldn't have 613 of these. Where a guy couldn't do anything. But juggle 613, do this, don't do that, look like this, don't do that. Be very careful. I love C.S. Lewis' classic line, we castrate and bid the gelding be fruitful. We have to be very careful. We want guys to go out and do something for God, they're going to need to breathe a little bit. And you put on them a proper mandate. I'm not talking about being silly and whatnot. I just mentioned that. But I do understand they have to know, they have to know this is what God has called me to do. Now, let me just close with a, an illustration here. We're going to have a prayer. When I was a young pastor in Las Vegas, uh, we saw a piece of land and we began to calculate among ourselves what it would do to build our own building. At the time, it was pretty wild. We didn't know what we were doing at all. And so um, I, I'm very naive. I have not been pastoring very long, really, two and a half years maybe. 
And so my first instinct was to call Prescott and um, ask them what to do. I thought maybe they, you know, they had this designer plan and they would tutor us through the process. <laughs> um, but it didn't exactly work that way. And, and, and let me tell you, they did their best to cooperate. But uh, I received a phone call from the assistant pastor maybe a couple weeks after a request. And it started like this. Uh, pastor Mitchell wants you to know. And, um, and then he began to explain to me how the fellowship worked. And let me tell you, this was really the tutorial I really needed. He says, we are a fellowship uh, of independent congregations that are, are bound together by a bond of a vision and a common bond and a family relationship. And uh, basically, when it comes to these sort of things, you're responsible for yourselves. You have to find other resources to figure this out. You know, you can talk to your pastor and other people. And um, I'm giving you the, 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 I'm giving you the, the nicer version of this. And, and, <laughs> and basically, um, you know, and, and I understand this. Listen, I understand this totally. It was, they basically, in a nutshell, didn't want our um, unpaid mortgage bills going to Prescott, which <laughs> makes total sense to me, and I would say the same thing. They did honor us by, by sending their um, constitution, which we used as kind of a basis to, you know, figure out what we needed to do. But I remember what I told our council. I was in my 20s. I remember Brother Kelly Getch. She, was, she would have been about the same age. Uh, I think we had a brother named Sam Aragon, who was the, like, the old man in the church. He's like 41 at the time. And uh, we were uh, in a couple other guys, and I remember telling them, guys, we're on our own. I said those words to them. But that wasn't a bad thing. You know what happened from that? We all of a sudden, it's kind of like we were empowered. It was one of the most empowering things that ever happened to me in ministry. All I had to do is see how it worked. And we were empowered and we were motivated. We just, at that time, we had Brother Gary Case. Gary and Lisa had come, and he was basically a student at a Baptist Bible college for the first couple of years that he was at uni, and uh, he had switched over to, to uh, another one. But he was there, and Gary uh, and I and, and Lisa, we worked on the Constitution, and all of a sudden we began completely uh, excited about this new project. And actually, I felt released. I felt released. Like, do what you got to do. We were empowered. And from there, we were able to put the plan together. And, and the, the more we expressed ourselves, the more we discovered what we could do. And we were able to build this church. And um, I'm telling you, something else happened to me. I became way more innovative and entrepreneurial in my way. Maybe to the extreme. Sorry, but, uh, you know, every once in a while, you got to dial it back. But, I, but what that, that set me free to say, man, we could do this. You're right. And just having their blessing and their endorsement uh, had more power than if they sent me, you know, a ream of papers on how to, how to talk to a loan officer. And I looked at the Las Vegas New Mexico Church website the other day, and I saw these works with... The incredible thing that God has done through uh, Ray and Patsy over there. And I, I'm, I'm, I feel like honored just to have been a part of it. What God had planned for those guys. But you know what? It, it all came from that little revelation. And that revelation came from, the, came from the horse's mouth. And that was, hey, take the reins of this thing and own it. And did that drive me away and send me? No, I'm still here. And that church is a great blessing to the fellowship at large. So what I'm talking about, as we close, recognizing the wonder of what a local church can become. This church is a shining star. We're not trying to go back to the Jesus people era and change our clothes and wear tie-dye and stuff like that. Although those teachers look kind of nice. Um, <laughs> what we want to do is continue in this revelation this revelation, these, those words I mentioned, indigenous, autonomous, they were minerals in our mother's milk of discipleship. And that was a great motivator for us to go forward and become what God has called us to be. I want you to bow your heads today. We're going to pray.
I appreciate the, the, the opportunity. Uh, God is good. God has done amazing things. He's done amazing things. And uh, we are here to continue in this inspiration, not to try to reconstruct it or repeat it, but to continue in it. That's our, that's our motivation. And so before we finish, I know this is the last day we've been having altar calls all week long. But you're here, you need Jesus. God has brought you here today, and maybe for whatever reason, you just find yourself this morning, you came with a friend or a family member, but boy, you need God. And so I'm going to put everything else on pause today and, and, and give you an opportunity to receive Jesus. Say, Pastor Ruby, I need Jesus. I need to get right with God. I want you to put your hand up. Wave it at me very quickly. God is dealing with you. God has brought you here today. This is you and God. This is an appointment that God has, has been working out with you for a long time. And you need to get right with God. Put your hand up and hold it there. Slip it up. I need to get right with God. Maybe you're a backslider. You've experienced. You've tasted. You've tasted. And you want to get right with God. I want you to put your hand up. Amen. I want, us, I want to challenge uh, us today. I, I, I know this, the theme of which I spoke is not this broad, uh, personal thing, but I believe every congregation, I'm talking to, to, to uh, pastors, you know, that, you know, you're out there fighting the good fight, and it's, it's a struggle to hold on to this ideal of being an ecosystem-type church. It's an ideal. It's a high one. It's a lofty one. But reaching... Beyond our grasp, like the old line from that poem, is so important when it comes to elements of faith and, you know, trying to do something in the kingdom of God. I want to challenge you. You know, I, I'm not trying to be demeaning. I'm talking about satellites. I think this is an, these, these things, ha like, in, like in life itself, these things happen. Our concerns become very pragmatic and practical and earthbound. And we lose sight of that big vision of what we can become. I believe every congregation and, and, and the mindset of the pastor has to view, God, this congregation, there are seeds to be where I, where I came from. And you have to contend for that. The altar's open. We're going to open this altar right now. We're going to take some time. I'm going to pray a prayer here before we finish, but I want to challenge you. Yesterday's gone, and today I'm in need. Holy Ghost power, breathe on me, breathe on me, breathe on me. Holy Ghost power, breathe on me. Because yesterday's gone and today I'm in need. Holy Ghost power, breathe on me, rain on me, rain on me. Holy Ghost shine. Today I'm in need. 
I know we're uh, this altar. If you're a pastor, and I want you, to, and you're in a situation where you're fighting a good fight, but you still got stages. Uh, I want to pray for you, and let me explain what I mean. I really like Adam Neal's illustration, baseball illustration. You know, baseball is a sport of statistics, and when someone drops a drops a, a one like that, you're like, "Whoa, that was an impressive one." And, uh, and he talked about hitting for the cycle. I won't go into all of it again, but it's a very impressive statistic there, Adam. Um, and so, basically, as pastors, we have a cycle, a church, church cycle, that is. You want to become self-supporting, right, where the church pays its own bills. You want a full-time pastor. Now, the reason you want a full-time pastor is not just so you don't have to work so much, because it's all part of God's big plan for you to become that ecosystem church. Third is you want to send out a worker. You want to send out a worker and people. And the fourth, the the home plate is you send out a missionary. And you hit for the cycle. In other words, that should be every church's goal to hit these bases. And sometimes we get trapped. How many know sometimes? I've I've done it. We get trapped. We get thrown out between first and second, you know. (laughs) But you have to contend for this. This has to be an ideal. That's what I want to emphasize. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm saying it's an ideal. It's something you have to lift up. Something you got to put on your wall and saying, this is what we are aiming for. It's something you have to teach your church. This is what we're aiming for. So again, just becoming a full-time pastor is only second base. Sending out workers and sending out missionaries. You know, all that conference stuff will take care of itself if you're doing that. I'm telling you. That will multiply quickly. But it's getting those things. And so what happens is we get stuck in being in a satellite phase. And it's easier now. We have a great fellowship. We have great area-wide events. We have strong preachers come in and all of that. And it serves its purpose. And it's no disrespect to what they do. But you should hunger for more in your own church. You should hunger for more. You should say, I want to be... And I want to have that ecosystem church. This is an ecosystem church, isn't it? Birds from everywhere are landing on these branches. And you say, why not? Why can't you want that? Well, I know we've all been doing this too long. We've got all the data of 40 years, or 50 years. And you say, yeah, but what about this? What about that? It's all true. It's all true. How many Pastor Warners do we have? How many Pastor Gregs do we have? How many, you know, you start asking those questions, right? How many Richard Rubies are there? And those are legitimate questions. But if we start thinking like that, you might as well, we might as well become, put Bible schools in every one of those cities and just start sending all the people to those. And then you can be a parish and he can be your bishop. We used to be Catholics. We know about this stuff. So, but... If you believe in the autonomous local church, right? The, do you believe in the wonder of the local church? Let's, all you pastors that are, you want to stand with me right now, just want to stand, just the pastors, we're going to pray. And I want you people just to stretch out your hands. Help us, all of us, with our vision. I'm in a certain place in, in South London where we need a building, that vision to break through. We need, we need to continue with the high ideal. We can't get, we can't get comfortable with, the, with, with what we got. Do you see what I'm saying? I don't mean be miserable and discontent, but, but there's something about faith, folks. Abraham taught us we always have to be looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. You've got to have that in your craw or else you won't, you'll become satisfied. And um, you'll just get in orbit and be a satellite. Let's lift our hands. And let's, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, Father, in Jesus' name. I claim the anointing and the spirit of the Antioch church, those seeds that belong to us. This first church shows all of us what you can do in every one of our churches. Lord God, by faith, we take dominion and we break barriers. We break glass ceilings. We break the spirit of unbelief. We put it in your hands. We put it in your, in your glory. And we seek to be fruitful 
and multiply to the glory of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just give God praise right now. Hallelujah. Father God, your power. God, let your power, God, break through all of us. Let your power, oh God, move. Oh God, stretch out your hand, God. Break us through, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Power of the Holy Spirit, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. As we stand here, Pastor Bill is going to lead us in one more chorus, and then he's going to close us in prayer. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Or no, I'm sorry. We got announcements. Well, I'm, I'm stepping out of my lane here. I'll turn a passage in. <laughs> Praise God. Let's worship. Surround me, oh Lord. Surround me, oh Lord. Surround me, oh Lord. Let your presence feel. your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Jesus. You are great. Your name is great and great to be praised. Hallelujah. We're going to dismiss. Please grab all of your trash, empty water bottles. Uh, just reach down, look on the floor as you go out to grab them. Be a blessing to the cleaning women. They, they got a lot of work to do, and they've been working all week. We appreciate them. And so let's bow our heads. Uh, what a great day of ministry. Uh, I'm going to have Pastor Thomas Williams lift his voice and dismiss us. <laughs>